Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is five ways conservation travel empowers people and protects animals. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Roger Smith. Roger, thank you so much for being here today and for taking us with you on a fabulous uh, trip here. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thanks, Sunny, that's fantastic. And uh, it's great to be here uh, at five o'clock in Southern Australia, and I mean 5 a.m. in the morning. But whatever, the, whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world or in the United States, thank you for joining us and thank you for joining Natural Habitat as well. Um, what, what's on my screen uh, is a, a beautiful bird called uh, the gray goshawk. And you might think that doesn't look gray, it's white. Well, in actual fact, it's a white morph of a gray goshawk, uh, an, Australian, uh, an Australian bird. Um, and it's very rare and it needs to be conserved and looked after. Uh, they're becoming less and less uh, common in the wild or anywhere for that matter. And um, I just thought that'd be a great way to start our show today. So let's get, uh, get into it. Um, oh, there it is. It tells you again, it's on the Great Ocean Road in Australia, which relates us to what we're talking about today. I will get on to the Great Ocean Road a little bit later. That's part of the southern journey with natural habitat. And there's what we're talking about. The five ways conservation travel empowers you and helps save animals. That's me. And that's where I come from. And that's the date, which is different here, by the way. It's July the 26th at the moment. And that's who we're talking about, natural habitat. So there's a picture of me. My name is Roger, Roger Smith. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about me. I've been guiding wildlife tours across Australia for 35 years, hell of a long time and absolutely love it. Um, I've, before that, I worked as a conservation activist. And as a result, I'm passionate about conservation in tourism. And uh, it's always been an important part of my life, conservation. My special loves are the macropods, the kangaroo family. And the other special love I have is people who fight to retain biodiversity and stop climate change. And, you know, I'm not a red ragger. I'm not one of these people who runs around screaming and yelling, but I believe it's really important that we do think about these things. And my favourite phrase is help nature while you enjoy it, which is what I try and do on our um, and I, on any of our tours that we, we that, that I guide on. So today I'll be talking about conservation travel firstly, and we might have a small gap in the middle for any questions, and then I'll move on to the Great Ocean Road um, section of Natural Habitats Australia South trip. For those of you who are coming on that trip with us, um, we look forward to seeing you in Australia. For those of you who have been on that trip or in, in Australia, welcome back. Now to start off with, I wanna talk about getting back to nature. Um, and these are the five ways that conservation travel empowers you and helps save animals. At first, some of these concepts may not look as though they actually help animals, but in actual fact, they do. I'm working on the basis that we, as the, the family of this planet, I suppose, the human family of this planet, have a major role to play in protecting it and understanding what it's about. And on tour is one of the best ways to do that because you're sharing directly on wildlife tours, you're sharing the world around you with other people. And that means, and that can empower you because that means that you can share your knowledge with other people when you come back and just generally change the way that people feel about this world. Because if you have an interest in nature, you may find, at times find that other people that you meet in life don't, un, don't have the same interest as you. And you feel like you're a little bit lonely and out there uh, with everybody else thinking you're slightly mad because you're interested in birds or whatever it might be. I think it's important to bring people along with you. And by doing that, they then have the same interest in helping wild animals as you do. So I believe one of the first things you need to do is choose a small group tour. And the reason for that is I'll talk about a little bit more as I go along, but small groups have less impact on the environment. And I believe we can interact better with each other in a small group. 
Um, I, the other important thing, and this is very critical, I think, is to seek leaders who are experienced nature guides, people who understand what nature is about and can tell you and support you in your quest for knowing more about the wildlife that you're seeing. I know this might sound like it's self-perpetuating, I'm a nature guide and so I'm suggesting nature guides, but if you've ever been on a tour with a tour leader who doesn't know about nature, you'll know um, that it's quite embarrassing sometimes not to have someone who knows what they're talking about. And that doesn't really help the group as a whole. Um, I've spent a lot of my life, as most of the guides I know, the wildlife guides I know, understanding nature. This is a really important point, learning from others on your tour. I can't, over, I can't overestimate or underestimate how important this is. Um, I've made a point of learning from my guests over the years. Uh, that came from an experience I had as a young guide many, many years ago when I came across a man, he was a geologist and I was talking about geology and it was pretty obvious to him that I didn't know exactly what I was talking about. And I've always warned guides that guides I train, try not to, to at times pretend you know something about things just because you're the, that you're the guide. And he very politely, he was an American guy, he, was, he very politely said to me, actually, Roger, those rocks are different than what you're talking about. And we went into detail. And as soon as I forgot my stupid male ego, I realised how important it was to learn from him. And I've done that ever since then. He was a fantastic guide and he taught me a lot. But I think sharing with others on your tours also expands the quality of the tour. You don't know everything about every, all things. Um, some people think they do, but we, none of us really do. And it's amazing how much we can learn from others. And that helps us to share their knowledge with other people when we come back from, uh, come back from our tour. Um, this is an unusual one. It may not seem relevant. Local knowledge will save you time and money. That's important because you're traveling sometimes to distant places, or even if you're not, you don't know all the things about that place and, and the people you're traveling with, in other words, your guides or tour leaders do know that. That'll save you time and it also saves you money in searching around, trying to find things that you're probably not gonna find anyway, which means that you're gonna have more enjoyment. It means you're gonna be able to share more with others. You're going to uh, have a much better understanding of what you're doing. And you're gonna go to places which maybe are better places to see wildlife. And this is why Natural Habitats chooses uh, people like us to work with you, because we can make it much easier for you to enjoy what you're doing, to get the photographs you, you, you get, and to learn from each other. And that, to me, then by, comes into empowerment of you, and it also helps you save animals, because you're going to share that knowledge with other people. Now, this one here is critical, and I've noticed that this is something that Natural Habitat does, and I think it's fantastic. Empowerment it continues after your tour. Um, I think the very fact that we've got this web webinar going on right now and the daily dose of nature is natural habitats way of sharing what's happened in the past, what's gonna happen in the future and just sharing an appreciation and an understanding of wildlife, which is what I'm talking about here. This conservation style travel will empower you and it will help you to help others to save animals and to help you to find things which help will help save animals. So after the tour is one of the best ways to learn from each other and to pass on your information to other people. So moving on, giving back follows this pathway as far as I'm concerned. It's a, it's a three-stage pathway and we've all been through it, I suppose, in certain ways. Some of us are partway through the experience, others are, are, have, have, have completed this experience and some are just beginning. This is on the Great Ocean Road. It's a picture that was taken of a gentleman whose name I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Uh, just a fantastic shot and I just thought it to be a good way of leading into um, uh, what I wanted to talk about. Experience is, is the first stage as far as I'm concerned. You experience things, you learn about the world and you start to understand more about it. So that's the first stage. The second stage is giving back in, in this sense, is learning. 
and I took this photograph in Africa. I just saw this in a in an area somewhere. I can't remember exactly where it was. It might have been in Botswana. We were in an outlook overlooking some beautiful land, and I saw this sign in a shelter in a national parks. It's about diversity. Um, these days we have a tendency to we call it biodiversity, but I'll just read this out in case you can't read it. Science has taught us that all creation is matter and energy interacting in an elegant dance of life and that biological and cultural diversity are the foundations of stability. And I think that last part of that, the foundations of stability is something we seem to have forgotten today. Um, but it's part, this is, this is us learning. As we experience, we then go on and learn and through that learning process, we begin to learn, uh, find out what we can do next. This is a this is a fantastic photograph of something, some work that we do here in Australia to protect koalas. And you might think that doesn't look like a man's protecting koalas. Well, he actually is. Um, he's pulling out a weed which is called bone seed, which is actually uh, an introduced weed in Australia. It comes from Africa, interestingly enough got a beautiful yellow flower and people brought it here many, many years ago. And it's, and it's and in some parts of Australia, particularly in Southern Australia, it's become a very, very uh, invasive plant. And it's and its stems are so thick, you might see some of them growing over here, that it impedes the movement of koalas through the bush, through the forest. And in the breeding season, that can be difficult because it means the boys and the girls don't get together. And if that doesn't happen, as we all know, there's no children no joeys as they're called and the reason we pull millions and millions of these bushes out each year is so that koalas can get together and and make babies and that's what this guy's doing and since we've started doing this we've pulled out millions of them as I've said we're acting in doing something which helps the environment and changes the world and what we've done in this case is we've allowed uh, we are now seeing more and more joeys, more young koalas in, in this area that we're doing this. So this is a way of giving back. Now, these are tools for giving back. And I want to talk about these as well. Uh, that's a picture of me and uh, one of the ladies on one of the trips that I've run. And she's got a camera out, her phone camera, and she's taking a photograph of a plant uh, near the sea. And we're taking this because we'd never seen this before. So part of giving and giving back is doing, doing something. I think this is probably the most important thing of all that we actually do something. This is the action, this is action, this is acting. And citizen science is a great way of doing that. Um, we're going to use various tools that we can, I'll talk about next to help the world to understand what we've seen in this particular location. Obviously, phone cameras and cameras generally are a wonderful way of recording what we're seeing. This is one another guide, a friend of mine. Um, he's taking a photograph. He's actually using the camera of the woman on the left because she couldn't see what he had seen. And she, she asked him to take the photograph. She had a few problems with her eyes, this lady. And it was a very, very difficult shot. But anyway, Part of this is reporting. And if I'm, I'm just gonna bring up two ways, online ways that you can report what you see so that citizen science becomes a reality. And so it helps the general scientific community. I'm assuming that some of you have heard, heard of eBird. It's a wonderful tool for recording the birds that you see and where you see them and a whole range of other information about them. Um, it's uh, more of a, a, a tool that, that uh, is a location tool and a recording of numbers, but not so much a tool for, for photographs, although you can put photographs on eBird. The other one, which is much more powerful in many ways, is iNaturalist. We use this a lot. We use both these tools a lot. The good thing about iNaturalist, and I highly recommend, they're both free, eBird and iNaturalist are free. Uh, they're extremely powerful tools that can be used anywhere in the world. Um, and it, you can download them onto your phone and you can in situ, you can actually record something. The wonderful thing about iNaturalist is you upload a photograph to your phone or to your computer. 
and it automatically looks for what that plant or animal might be and makes uh, suggestions of anim plants or animals in that, in that area because it also uploads the uh, GPS location of where you are. And um, you can then choose what, which you think it is. Um, and that then goes out to the community and the community will tell you whether they think you're correct or not. Uh, they're not rude about it. They just simply say, look, my feeling is this may not be that. I think it's this. And after a certain number of people have commented on it, it then becomes, becomes what they call a, a, a research grade. And uh, then people in the scientific community can, can learn about this, can use this, and it helps them to understand whether species numbers are increasing, falling when, when they're in a certain area and a whole lot of other information. So reporting is important, that's another tool. Now, this is a fantastic photograph. I love it. It was taken by a dear friend of mine. Um, it's a Western grey kangaroo in a pretty harsh environment, in a very harsh time of year, uh, in a very harsh, a very harsh period of time, which was caused by climate change. Many, many animals in this area died when there was a long drought in Australia, which was significantly greater than what they normally are in this country. And it was actually caused by climate change. I can't overestimate how important it is that we stop climate change. As you know, in the Northern Hemisphere at the moment, in many parts of North, in many parts of North America, the, the heat and the fires are terrible. We had the same problem at the same time as this photograph was taken in 2019, 20, uh, huge bushfires here in Australia. Um, El Nino is increasing as we speak. We need to do something about that. Another way of, is protecting biodiversity. Um, this pink cockatoo um, is one of my favourite birds. It's one of the, Australia is the land of the cockatoo. And these birds are becoming rarer and rarer because of lack of food and because of lack of water. Um, and also because they're poached uh, and they're taken out of the wild and so, sold overseas. Um, but protecting biodiversity is, is, one, is important. And I think it's important that we all help to help the people around us and the world understand what the importance of biodiversity is. So they're the tools. Now, I'm just wondering that before we head on to the Great Ocean Road, and, and I just thought that uh, there might be a few questions. Um, I'm just wondering, are there any questions that we can um, get into at the moment, Sunny? No questions at the moment, just some folks who are happy to see you. <laughs> some well, nice that's... comments. <laughs> but no oh, well, questions at this point. If we want to wait just a, a moment to see if any pop up real quickly, but All nothing right. so I'll... far. I'll just put that up there. That That's just a little bit of fun I put in. Thanks, Sunny. Um, mm -hmm. This is a, this photo is upside down. And um, I did this because I took this photo when I was out with a group um, uh, in a location and we, we watched this old male black wallaby at a water hole. And at one point when the breeze stopped blowing, we suddenly realized that uh, the image, that his reflection was reflecting in the water hole. So I turned it upside down for you because after all, we're, we're in Australia. It's called a black wallaby. It's one of the macropod family. And if you look very carefully, um, the upside down part of him, you can see he's got a tear in his ear. I don't know whether that'll be obvious on your screen, but black wallabies fight other black wallabies and they rip each other's ears apart. Um, it's, a, it's a funny thing. And as they get older, like all of us old guys, we start to look a bit torn and ragged. I'm just gonna have a little, a little um, drink and I'll be back with you. Let me go ahead and give you a question that popped up. Great. What what do you do in your home to prevent single use items? I feel we in the industry must lead by example. Any tips or habits that you've developed um, to, to address conservation in your daily life? Wow, that's a great question. Um, just about everything I do in my daily life is designed to try and re reduce waste, particularly plastic. Um, <clears throat> we, in Australia, we have the ability to recycle plastic. 
Um, and we, all the plastic that we get um, has two techniques of being recycled. And by the way, this doesn't happen right across Australia, but it happens in the area where I live. Um, we have two techniques. One is hard plastic or you know, not soft plastic bags. Um, they go out into a recycle bin. We have two bins at our place or two trash bins, I think you call them. Um, and one of them is just for normal rubbish, uh, un, you know, compostable rubbish and other things like that. And the other one is for waste that doesn't compost and particularly plastic. And that's sorted when it gets to a plant. With soft plastic, we go in, we put that into a special bag and we take that to the supermarkets and they have recycle bins in the supermarkets and, they, and those, that plastic is recycled. But we have solar energy where I live and I could go on and on, but um, I put a lot of effort into it. But at the same time, I do accept that it's not easy. I'm not perfect, none of us are perfect, but I think is every little bit that we do to move the needle just a little bit in the good direction as opposed to the bad direction, <laughs> keeping it nice and simple. I think that anything we do is better than doing nothing. And I think the travel industry has more of a responsibility to do this than just about any other industry because um, this is where we, we can share with each other on tour. We can actually share this on tour. And an important part to do with, um, let's just say um, uh, the environment and biodiversity and climate change is that if we don't look after this planet, there won't be a future for conservation travel for, or for any type of travel for that matter. I don't know whether anyone's noticed, but the island of Rhodes in Greece is talking about how seriously their travel industry has been impacted. Anyway, look, I won't go on too much, but I just think that every little thing that we do to move the needle in the good direction is better than doing nothing. You there, Sandy? Sunny? I'm Hello. here, go ahead. All right, well, we'll move on from there and thank you for your question. And I, I, agree, with, I agree with that. So, isn't that a beautiful picture? Um, I'm going to show you where that is because we're getting onto the Great Ocean Road now and the part of the Southern Natural Habitat Southern Trip. Welcome to the Southern Ocean, a wonderful ocean. I, I wonder how many of you have ever heard of the Southern Ocean. One of the things I discovered on a tour a little while ago, well, many years ago, someone said to me, what is the Southern Ocean? And I realized that a lot of people in the Northern Hemisphere have never heard of it but it's one of the most important oceans in the world. It's a huge ocean that spans the entire southern, uh, the southern seas. It goes in a complete 360 circle around underneath uh, the continents that used, to, that used to be all joined together. And I'll tell you all about that. Out there is Antarctica. It's only 3000 kilometers away, about 2000 miles. But it was once connected to Australia, and I'm going to tell you a bit about this and about how the Southern Ocean got to be where it is. And I just put that arrow in there for fun. So how did it happen? How did the Southern Ocean come about? I'm going to start it off with a typical thing. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there was a place called Gondwana. Everyone in Australia knows about Gondwana. We're all brought up at school to learn about Gondwana, and there it is. Um, I hope you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor, Sunny? Yes, I can see it moving. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a picture of a plate, what the southern part of the um, of the globe looked like around about around about uh, 150 million years ago. And a, a continent, which is this great big lump you can see, broke off from another huge supercontinent in the northern hemisphere called Pan Pangaea, and it broke away and began to drift southwards. Now you can see where the South Pole is there. This is at around about 150 million years ago, and the equator, I think, is that line just up near the, the right-hand side of your screen. And you'll notice, uh, I, and some of you will know about this already, but you'll notice that there's a number of different continents that the person who drew this has put in South America, Africa, India, Australia, the Antarctic, and a whole lot of other little bits and pieces here on the left-hand side. 
the um the blue parts the pale blue parts are what these continents would have actually looked like there's a few lakes between them and no one knows exactly what it looked like but this continent of Gondwana covered in warm in cool temperate rainforest and warm temperate rainforest towards its north um, and tropical rainforest no doubt was gradually moving southwards it eventually ended up in a, which I'll show you in a minute down uh, towards the south and it started to break up different different continents broke away Africa South America India India was amazing it shot across what we now know as the Indian Ocean at high speed bumped into what was Pangaea at the time, hit it so hard that it forced up the Himalayas and caused all sorts of strife um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's still doing that. Um, India is still pushing its way northwards, as is Australia. Australia was the last to leave. It le started to leave around about 50 million years ago. And I'll move on and just give you a little bit more understanding of what went on, but it's very, it's spectacular. It's just worthwhile noting the location of the continent in relation to the South Pole. Um, because the next, the next slide that I'm going to show you, as Africa, South America and India sp uh, split away, um, I just wanted to point out that where these continents are shown at the moment, 45 million years ago, I mean, is not necessarily where they were. They're just used for context that Antarctica would have been much further north than what it is. And just imagine everything moving from the top right of your screen to, to the bottom left of your screen. Now, 45 million years ago, these blue sections were, were land and the white sections were sea. Now, it's just worthwhile noting that there is a land bridge between southern Australia, and by the way, the Great Ocean Road is just in this area here, south southeastern Australia. It is worthwhile noting that there was a link between Australia, Antarctica, and, and South America. That's the bottom end of South America. You can't see it very well here at the moment, but that little green bit up near A, near the letter A, you may not be able to see it, is India disappearing up towards the north. Um, but it's important to recognize this link because something happened here that you guys in, the, in uh, North America know about. It's an animal and I'll tell you what it is shortly, but just for fun, I'll, I'll keep it quiet for a minute. The marsupials at around about 50 million years ago began to um, start to exist on the planet, started to evolve. And this area all through here was covered in cool temperate rainforest. It wasn't covered in ice. There would have been snow capped peaks, but it was quite capable for, for wildlife and for plants to move right across this land bridge into South America and to, to a certain extent for plants and animals to move the other way. A, an interesting thing happened. Gradually, the ocean started to come in from the left as Australia started from the north from the west, I should say, Australia started to move towards the north. And this split started to appear. Um, and once getting back to the wildlife I was talking about before, South America started to move northwards as well. It had a few mouse marsupials on it. And I'll just get to the nub of this story because Gradually, and I think you can just see it through here, Australia finally split it about 45 million years ago. Antarctica and South America were still connected and the marsupials that gathered here continued to move northwards until at around about 30 million years ago, um, or around about 30, 30 million to 25 million years ago, Africa, sorry, South America dis, uh, dis, disengaged from Antarctica and continued to move northwards. Now it doesn't show it on the map here, but South America hit North America. Excuse me for a minute, just, I'm just losing my voice here. And um, the, when it hit North America, a little creature or possibly a few little creatures crossed through Mexico into North America and the only one of them that remains there today is the opossum uh, as a marsupial. And I just thought you'd like to know that this series of events, 
allowed the marsupials in the form of the opossum to get into North America. I can't imagine what the poor devil found when it got there because suddenly it came across carnivores and a whole lot of herbivores that had never come across before, hard, hard hooved animals, which we didn't have in Australia until Europeans got here. And the poor little devil managed to survive. So every time you see an opossum, just bless its little heart. How on earth it managed to survive, I have no idea. Australia continued moving northwards and um, a quite interesting thing happened, apart from opossums getting into North America, which was pretty amazing in its own right. You may have noticed as I went along that these oceans all connected up. Uh, the Southern Pacific, uh, the Southern Atlantic, Southern Indian Ocean all connected up. And as the earth was spinning, the waters of the new ocean, the Southern Ocean, started to move around the planet in a circum, in a in a in a uh, east, a west to east direction, and an incredible thing happened because by about this time, all the continents were roughly where they are now. Although South America and North America were still, and and Australia, I mean, were still moving northwards. So these this ocean started to spin around, and it did an incredible thing. What it did is it cut off the warm currents coming from the tropical areas from coming down towards the coastlines of these continents and it started to cool and the earth started to cool and an amazing thing happened. Antarctica froze. It was one of the most significant things that had ever happened in the world. The Southern hemisphere became one of the cold, had became one of the coldest parts of the world and those cold currents that it split off and has disappeared up towards the north had an impact on all the currents, all the ocean currents of the world. So this was an incredible event, quite an amazing event that changed the nature of the world that we live in. So you'll be looking at this particular rift um, around, if you do come to Australia to the southern trip, you'll be looking at this little section of Australia through here where all this happened. Now let's go ahead and have a look at the wildlife of the Great Ocean Road. One of the most beautiful animals in the world, the koala. And when you travel with uh, natural habit habitat through Southern Australia, you will almost certainly see a koala. If you don't, it'll be very upsetting. It'll mean they're, they're in decline at the moment. I know no one likes to hear that, but we're working very, very hard to ensure their survival. I actually personally know this koala because she lives near me. Um, uh, but that's, that's a beautiful picture of a koala in a gum tree. The Eastern Grey Kangaroo, I love this photo, isn't that a beautiful, beautiful photo? It's a female, young female Eastern Kangaroo. She'd be around about, um, she ran about three or four years old at maximum with a little joey in her pouch. And if you look at this little joey, you can see the, how big her pouch is. And you'll see just here, that dark patch there is one of its feet its back foot, this is one of its front feet, and this is its other front foot. When they're in the pouch, they can get so tangled up, it's so funny. I've actually seen a little joey sticking out of its mother's pouch with its, with its legs above its head. How on earth it did that, I have no idea, but there you go. This is a little family group of uh, not necessarily, they're not husband and wife, they don't do that in the Aboriginal world, they share around during their life, but. But anyway, just a great photo that one of my guides took a while back of um, uh, a little joey on the left, a female in the middle and a, a big male on the right. He's not a huge male. These guys can get up to around about uh, five and a half, six feet tall, but you can pick the difference between the females and the males, particularly by their arms. The females have petite, small arms with little hands. And I think this is another female here. It's a bit hard to tell when they're this small. But you notice the big front legs, the front feet of the males. You can always tell the males by their big arms and their huge hands. By the way, they're called macropods, which is Latin for big foot. And you can see the big foot here. This is the, these are the feet of the kangaroos, this one here. This is the ankle. Um, and as you go up, you come up to the knee and round here. Very, very powerful, powerful animals that can jump huge distances. 
down on the Great Ocean Road uh, near the coastline. What we're doing here is we're waiting for the shearwaters to come in. The shearwaters are a fantastic bird that we see between October and March. A little short break in November when they go off to, to, uh, to mate, but they come from the Northern Hemisphere all the way from Alaska down the west coast of um, the United States. They cross the Pacific Ocean and they come into the islands of, the, of Southern Australia and they breed on the islands and we go out to have a look at them as they come in at dusk. I can't show you one because they're very, very hard to photograph um, in the evening, but these people are waiting for them to come in. This is sunrise on the Great Ocean Road. This is the Southern Ocean. These are some of the limestone sea stacks of uh, the area the, the, uh, that are famous along um, uh, the Great Ocean Road. There's also beaches. These are crested terns uh, on, against the Southern Ocean. And this man's getting a photo, fantastic photograph of them. They're mainly crested terns. There might be one or two other species amongst them, but they primarily look like crested terns to me. I just love this photo. And then we have the laughing kookaburra, one of the great birds of Australia. It's a kingfisher. It's a fairly big kingfisher, um, big powerful bill because this bird actually catches snakes and lizards and anything it can. Sometimes they'll even take small birds out of nests and some of the big, some of the smaller birds hate them for it. Beautiful blue markings on their wing. And I can't do this here live, um, but they have a loud laughing noise, which will rock your pants. Absolutely fantastic they are. We all love them, <clears throat> and many of you would know their um, the the song "Kookaburra Kookaburra sits in the old gum tree." I'm not going to try and sing it. My voice is having enough trouble as it is. Just give us a sec. I'm just getting over a cold, uh, my friend. So forgive me. Um, another picture of a kookaburra. Um, there's two species of kookaburras in Australia: the southern and the northern. The laughing kookaburra in the south is the one that we have. And I love this shot because it's directly over, this, over a view of the Southern Ocean where we've got a great viewpoint. I'm not saying you'll see this kookaburra, but it often appears in this location. Then the cockatoos. There's a number, we've got about five or six species, six, seven species of cockatoo in Australia. We're the land of the cockatoo. I particularly love this one. These are the gang gang cockatoos. And these are three males. Lord knows why there's three males all sitting together. They're probably just having a bit of a bit of a boy get together. But haven't they got a fantastic uh, headdress? Wonderful, wonderful birds. Very quiet actually, and it's very unusual to see them this exposed. The echidna, the beginning of it all, an egg-laying uh, animal that produces milk. Isn't that bizarre? A lot of people don't know that Australia is actually unique um, to do with the number of mammals we have. We th have three types of mammals here. The placental mammals like us and uh, horses and goats and mice and rats. We also have the, um, the uh, marsupials, uh, which are the kangaroos and so forth. And we have the myotremes, the, the echidna and the platypus. Now on the southern trip to Australia, you will see platypus, not along the Great Ocean Road, unless you're very, very lucky. We do have them on the Great Ocean Road, but more often in Tasmania. But this is an echidna and, and it's a wonderful animal, very, very tough. And we find them all over Australia. And another wonderful bird that you might see if you look very, very hard. They're very good at disguising, disguising themselves to look like a piece of wood. Uh, these are the frog mouse. We have a couple of different species of frog mouse in Australia. This is the tawny frog mouth, and don't they look bizarre? Wonderful bird, and they call it a frog mouth because if they open that bill up, and I haven't got a photograph of this, it's got a big yellow gape. One of the great things that you see on the Great Ocean Road is the ancient forest of Gondwana. This is what this is what Gondwana used to look like, and there's small sections of it along the Great Ocean Road. This, this is unusual because there are no eucalypts here. These are the um, trees of Antarctica, that, or of Gondwana. You would find the remnants of these trees under the ice of Antarctica, and you'd also find them in some parts of uh, southern South America. 
they contrast with the eucalypt forests of Australia, which are the young forests of Australia. At the bottom of these, you can see the transition between cool temperate rainforest going into, into eucalyptus, dry eucalyptus forest or sclerophyll forest as it's called. These are young mountain ash trees, eucalyptus. They grow much, much bigger than this, but um, this is just a beautiful photograph. I thought you'd like to see with some fantastic ferns in it, the huge, big, uh, soft tree ferns of the Otway Ranges on the Great Ocean Road. Some bracket fungi uh, up in the rainforest. I just, I just like that photo. Oh, one of the great carnivores of Australia, the Otway carnivorous snail, be careful of this might bite your foot off. No, I'm joking. It's only a very small animal. That's around about um, one and a half inches long. Uh, it doesn't retract into its shell, but it's one of the few carnivorous snails of, of the world. This was actually crossing a road and we actually stopped to move it off the road because this animal is reducing in, num in numbers because of climate change. It needs a wet forest to live. And it's, a, it's very, very rare. It's, it, the chances of seeing this are small, but we'll keep an eye out for it. But that's a carnivorous snail. Um, it's a little bit like a lion. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, purple swamp hen is one of the wetlands we travel through. Lovely bird. One of the most beautiful um, genuses of Australia, the fairy wrens. This is the superb fairy wren, the male in his beautiful breeding plumage. Aren't they beautiful birds? This bird would be around about, probably around about uh, four inches to five inches high from the base of its feet up to the tip of its tail, maybe a little bit smaller actually. These are emus. Uh, we'll hopefully show you some emus. Um, one of the second largest birds living in the world today. These are all adults and uh, one of my favorite creatures they are. I might be interested to, it's a bit hard to see, but that's an emu's wing just there. There's another, you can just see their wing there. They've all, re they can't fly now, but um, they've, and they don't have true feathers anymore or not flight feathers, I should say. The 12 apostles on the Southern Ocean, in the Southern Ocean mist, we're gonna take you to the 12 apostles a few times. They're an iconic part of Australia, beautiful options for photography, but also a lot of birds nest in, the, in and around these little, these islands, these sea snacks, sea stacks, I should say. And um, you often find birds in these top areas through here, nesting through the tops here. And some of the other, this is an island here, and they'll also nest up in the tops of these islands. This is where the shear world is nest. And that's the Southern Ocean, and we'll say goodbye to it. And jo please join us in Australia soon. Um, uh, and I just want to finish up there. Thanks, Sonny. And I'll, I'll finish up. Um, and if there are any, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about, please uh, ask a question and um, please join Natural Habitat and we'll show you a bit of Australia, our wonderful part of Southeastern Australia. Thank you, everybody. And sorry about my voice. Are there any questions, Sonny? Yes, Roger. Thank you so much for that presentation. We do have some questions ready. Um, how old can a kangaroo get in the wild? And also, how old do koalas and wombats usually, and wallabies usually, live to be? That's a good question. Um, let's talk about kangaroos first. Kangaroos and wallabies are part of the macropod family. They're all marsupials, as you know. They're not like a lot of animals, they're not long lived like us. Um, a koala female, the oldest koala I've ever known has been about 18 years ago and she was a female. Male kangaroos will live, if they're lucky, they'll live to around about 15 years. And interestingly with both of them, with just about all marsupials, they never stop growing, they grow slower. Unlike us, we stop growing and have a tendency to get smaller as we get a bit older. Whereas the, the kangaroos and the wallabies and most of the marsupials gradually get bigger and bigger. The female, the female koala and the female kangaroo live to around about between 16 to 18 years. The males of those species will often live at much less. Uh, male kangaroos will, you, you often see them dying at around about 10 to 12 years of age. And the same with koalas. 
Wombats live a shorter life. Um, I don't know, I can't give an exact answer, but probably in the vicinity of 10 to 12 years. Um, the smaller an animal gets, the, the shorter its lifespan. Um, one of our shortest lived animals uh, is a little tiny um, creature, which looks a little bit like a mouse. And they live for, the males only live for one year. But in, at the end of their first year, they get involved in one of the biggest sexual fantasies of any male. They basically spend many, spend around about two or three weeks mating with just about every female they can find. Uh, it's very, very successful. The females live for two years and produce hundreds of babies or dozens of babies, but the males die as a result of their efforts, let's put it that way, but they are very, very successful. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, are kangaroos protected in Australia? Kangaroos uh, one of the great conundrums of this country. I'm a, I'm a macropod lover. I do come from a farm uh, in the desert and I've been involved, I uh, know about people who hate kangaroos. A lot of Australian farmers don't like them. Different parts of Australia that you are allowed to cull certain species. I don't necessarily agree with, with what goes on, but some, some species, and especially the big red and the greys, and the eastern grey and the western kangaroo, the western grey kangaroo are allowed to be are allowed to be culled on on farming properties. Where I live, I live near, I live out in the bush, and um, some evenings uh, I'm very upset to hear people are blowing kangaroos away. Um, and I, but it, people in Australia are becoming more and more cognizant of how important it is to protect them, and the cull numbers are reducing. But other species are highly protected. The, the ones I mentioned, the Eastern Grey, the Western Grey and the Red, red are quite common. Um, but the other ones that are rare, you're not allowed to shoot or kill at all. So it's, it's quite variable right across the country. Some people do it illegally as well, but we have a bit of that, I suppose, in every country. Not something I like to talk about. And I've actually seen the results of culling and it's, it's very upsetting. Mm. What do the Otway carnivorous snails eat? <laughs> um, they, any worms, um, any, small, um, any small animals that they come across uh, that don't have an exoskeleton, they will try and, and eat. I don't know, I haven't got a full details of everything that they eat, um, but I do know that one of their favorite, favorite things is earthworms. So, um, they do eat them very, very slowly. I understand. I've never actually seen one eating anything, but I do know that they're carnivorous. And like a good guide, I'm not going to tell you I know all about them because we're still learning about them. But good question, and I'm sorry I can't give you a detailed answer. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll look at it. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the population of the duck-billed platypus? Do they have specific um, predators? What is their lifespan? What do they eat? All right. Um, the duck bill, the platypus lives mainly on the east coast of Australia. And I include the island of Tasmania as part of that. Um, they, have an, they have a tendency to extend round to the Great Ocean Road and a little bit further to the west, but not much further. Usually on the oceanic side of the Great Dividing Range, which runs down the eastern side of Australia and heads across um, to the west down near the southeast in the, in the clean rivers. And it's important this, platypus require very, um, they, they require water, which isn't affected by very, very often by turbidity or by chemicals or by pollution, and that will have a big impact on them. They have a tendency to, um, well, not a tendency, they feed underwater with their eyes closed and they use their bill, which is like the echidna has got sensors in it, electronic sensors in it, to pick up the creatures that they eat, which are like small underwater crayfish, worms, um, any underwater insect life, and sometimes fish, but generally not, they forage around in the bottom to pick them up. Um, they don't have any teeth 
although back in history, back in as they were evolving, they were a much bigger animal. Um, but they are very much influenced by climate change because if their water, if in other words, if their creeks and rivers that they live in dry up, these platypus have nowhere to go and they die. As far as their predators are concerned, um, the, the main predator of the platypus are some of their introduced animals in the form of dogs and cats and other animals like that, which will take them. Um, they also are predated on by birds of prey, by the raptors in particular, by raptors. Um, and as a result of that, platypus have got the most incredible eyesight. As soon as they come to the surface, they have a full 180 degree view of the world around them as soon as they open their eyes. And if they notice any difference in what's going on around them, they'll immediately dive again. Um, it's not common for them to be killed, uh, but I have seen on a number of occasions, I have seen um, sea eagles of all things, taking take a platypus, I've seen a sea eagle take a platypus out of a river once. And it was absolutely very distressing actually, but I mean, that's life. Um, and it killed that platypus. But um, they're very, very wary uh, of that and they go to a lot of effort to cover their cover themselves up. They make a burrow in the bank of the rivers that they live in. Um, as far as their lifespan is concerned, I think a platypus from memory that lives for around about eight years, I might not have that correct. I'm sorry, I'll, that's another one. I'm just not exactly sure how long they live. But once again, um, I can guarantee you this, the females will live longer than the males because the males fight and they can injure each other. Male kangaroos, uh, sorry, male platypus have a spur in, just near their hind leg and they can wrap their legs around anything, another male, but you, you never pick up a male platypus because they can inject you with venom. The other, and they can kill each other using these spurs. And it's almost impossible to get them off you if they do that. You've got to be very careful handling the male. But I think it's around about eight years from memory. Mm. That's it, Sandy. Yeah. What What is the status of dingoes regarding hunting or restrictions or controlling them? Yeah. Um, the dingo, I don't know what it, what it is about the dingo. I personally love the dingo. It's one of the most amazing Australian animals. One of the, it's been, it's a, it's a mammal that's lived in Australia, a placental mammal that was brought over here from Southeast Asia. Uh, probably, we think around about 10,000 years ago, but it may have been longer. Um, they, they are related to the canines. Um, they then we don't call them dogs, they're dingoes, they're incredibly intelligent. And as a result of that, a lot of farmers in Australia don't like them. Uh, we've, imp we've impeded on their land um, and made an impact on the, on the dingoes. The dingoes at times don't have enough to eat. And because they are a very intelligent animal, they'll go to just about any length, just like wolves will. Uh, they hunt in packs if they need to and they will kill sheep and in many parts of Australia dingoes it, are allowed to be killed they're pretty much the same in the same way as kangaroos are um, but more and more these days we're learning that if they as with wolves in in North America and other parts of the world it's been found that if they are allowed to survive in the environment they do kill other animals which will have an impact on, on sheep and other animals grazing in Australia. And so some farmers are now, especially in the drier areas, are allowing dingoes to, to live alongside their sheep. They might kill a few sheep, but they're also killing um, cats and other cats and other dogs in Australia, which are introduced. And they're also assisting with the with um, uh, increasing the amount of feed and fodder for the animals that uh, that the people are growing on their land. So it's a bit of a give and take situation and um, they're an amazing animal. And unfortunately, once again, um, the farming community, and I'm one of that community, by the way, the farming community doesn't like them. And once again, this brings us back to empowerment if people can talk and help farmers to understand that they're beneficial, that's a good thing. Mm. Well, that's the last question we have time for today. So I wanna hand it back to you for some closing comments. 
Okay, I'm going to close off with uh, a, an eastern grey kangaroo, hopping at full speed across the um, across the landscape. And um, I want to thank you all uh, for being here today and being a part of this. And where I'd love to tell you, ask you to come out to Australia with us. And I'd like to thank Natural Habitat Adventures for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Have a wonderful day. I'm now going to go and get a cup of coffee and maybe go back to bed for a little while because it's now six o'clock. And I'd love to thank you, Sunny and Natural Habitat for having me on board. All the very best, everybody. Well, it's our pleasure, Roger. Thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. I also want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation. We will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.